Hi everyone, um, welcome back to Allied Health 209 Laboratory Testing. Okay, so we're going to start talking about your analysis. This is something we're going to start working on in lab soon, and um, this is chapter three in your textbook. And remember guys, for you to be really successful, the, the key elements are to watch the PowerPoint presentations and to read the corresponding chapter in your textbook. And then what we do is we use all our hands-on experience of actually performing your analysis in lab along with the information we learn here in lecture with our PowerPoint presentations and the information you read in your textbook. We put it all together and we use it to not only memorize but learn this information so that when we're out doing our clinicals and out working as a lab assistant or a medical assistant, we're actually able to perform our job really, really well. So let's get started. We're talking about chapter three in your analysis. This will be on our next chest and remember just for reference, um, your test one on chapters one and two open today, Wednesday, and um, quiz one on profiles and panels, we will be taking Monday, September the 21st in lab class. So when you come into lab class, instead of doing your usual routine, we'll just come in first. You just need a number two pencil. You'll put your backpack, including your phones and any smart watches in your backpack, in your cubby, have a seat, and we will take our profiles and panels quiz. So I hope you guys have all along and especially now before Monday studying those profiles and panels so that you will um, you'll be able to do well on that test. Um, so um, chapter three on your analysis so let's get started here okay. So remember when you come to class make sure you're on time okay because when we're face to face in lab we have limited time and we want to try to get as much hands-on experience as humanly possible, right? And remember, be polite, guys. Make sure that you put those cell phones on silent and you guys are doing real well with this. Come and talk to me if you have um, an emergency going on, so I'll be aware if you go back to your backpack looking at your phone a lot, I'll understand why, because you're waiting on something. Remember, take those phone calls out in the hallway and uh, be real respectful of other people teaching in the hallway. Remember, I do not want you to have your phones on you when you're at your lab desk or back when we're when we're drawing blood at the drawing stations you do not want to get blood or body fluids on your phone it's a it's a magnet for germs and remember we're trying to break that chain of infection right we do not want to spread those germs from your gloved hands to your phone to you or home to one of your family members okay and this is just a little review to go back over some things that you've already learned you guys took your um, your test in um, your microscope test. But remember, how would you bring a specimen from blurry into focus? You use your focus knobs, right? And remember when you're on that low power, and we always start on that low power, right? Then we bring, use the course knob, and this is the only time we use the course knob is when we're on that low power. And we take that big course knob and we start bringing that stage up closer and closer as we're looking through our oculars until we see something. Then we can stop and use our smaller fine focus knobs to bring that specimen, whether it's red, uh, whether it's a blood smear or some other type of specimen into clear focus where you can clearly see what we were looking at in lab was our those our cells, right? We looked at a blood smear, so the, and we wanted those red cells to be really clear in focus. So, which control control knob should you use to focus a specimen when using oil immersion oil immersion lens? Remember, we focused it with we brought that stage all the way up with that course, and we could see something, right? And then we used our fine to bring it into fine tune, so it really looked really, really crystal clear and we can make out our red cells even though they were very, very small and our white cells even though they were very, very small. And then once it was in really good focus, then we used our, remember we used that nose to move to our next objective because we never grab our objectives and move them, right? So we moved it to the next power and then from there on, we never touched that course again. We used our fine focus knob to bring it back into focus. It shouldn't take much adjustments. If you got it really right the first time, then we use that nose to move it again, right, to the next power, find focus it in again, and then as we move it in between to our next um, objective, which is our oil immersion objective, while we're in between the two objectives, 
about to move into the 100x oil immersion lens, that's when we put one drop of oil on that slide. Remember, we need a good drop, but we do not need a bunch of oil. And you only want oil to ever get on that oil immersion slide and no other slide. Then we move it into the oil, find focus it in, and that's where we are, right? So remember, you never use that coarse a, a knob again, right? What would you use to increase the upper limit of the refraction with the 100 times lens? Remember, the 100 times lens is our oil immersion slide, is our oil immersion lens, right? So consequently, that would show us that we're using that immersion oil to increase that upper limit, right? So how do you calculate the total magnification of a specimen? You multiply the power of your oculars, that's the ones you're looking through, right? By the uh, power of whatever objective you're looking through at that time. So when cleaning the objectives, which lens should you clean first? Remember, you always wanna clean that oil immersion lens first, make sure it's good and clean, and then you know, get new stuff and clean the rest of them. You never wanna move that oil to any other lens, okay? So which law demands that test results in the lab be accurate? CLIA, right, 1988. CLIA 1988 was a law that came up that any lab anywhere in the United States that was testing body fluids, blood or body fluids from a human specimen had to follow CLIA law guidelines. So do you record normal or abnormal QC results on the Levi Jennings chart? Both, remember, you run your results and no matter what comes in, whether it's an in or out, whether it's normal, abnormal, whatever it is, every QC result gets recorded on our Levi Jennings chart. Where else should our QC be, results be recorded? On the QC log, right? What is a calibration of an instrument? It's the standardization or settings an instrument so that the, it works correctly with the test reagent, right? And we follow our manufacturer guidelines on how often and how we calibrate each one of our instruments. So what is the overall process that strives to improve the reliability, efficiency, and quality of healthcare? Quality assurance, right? Quality assurance is the overall process from the minute that patient steps out of their car in the parking lot to the minute they're discharged and taken out to their car. That entire process from A to Z is what we refer to as quality assurance. If you run a pregnancy test and the patient sees you hanging their chart on the door and wants to know the results, what should you say to that patient if they ask you for their results? You tell them that just wait, the doctor will be in shortly and they will discuss your results with you. If they continue to pressure you, just let them know that this is not a part of your job, that you're not allowed to discuss this with them and that the doctor will be in shortly. What do you call QC results that fall within two standard deviations of the mean? Accurate, right? They're accurate. They're falling within those limits. What are policies used to protect healthcare, healthcare workers from exposure to blood and body fluids in healthcare facilities? Standard precautions, right? What is the policy that states that all patients should be considered infectious for bloodborne pathogens? Universal precautions. Guys, make sure that you're looking in your textbook and you're understanding the key differences between standard precautions and universal precautions. What is the method of showing test reliability where an unknown specimen is sent from an outside lab for evaluation? or proficiency test, right? We run controls each shift, right? Each day that we're testing patients or testing for that specific analyte. Those controls are ones that we have inside our lab. We know what they should run. When we run those controls, we check them against what they should be running and make sure they fall within range and then we record them, both in our QC log and on our Levi Jennings and we chart and graph it, right? So we already know what the results should be of our QC that we run inside our lab. But due to CLIA, they're going to send out 
a, a sample to you that you do not know what it should be running. So what you do is if you've been calibrating your instruments, doing your maintenance, and you've been running your QC, and your QC is coming within range, then when you run that proficiency test, you should get the result that they are looking for. But you will send that back to them and then they will determine if you're doing it correctly. So we're gonna get into talking about uh, your analysis in chapter three. And guys, please make sure you watch these PowerPoint presentations, fill out your review guides, read your chapters and your corresponding chapters in your textbook and study those review guides, okay? These are your learning objectives. I'm not gonna read each and every one of them to you but you need to understand that these are the things you will be able to demonstrate, describe, discuss, define, and explain. After you finish watching these, after you read your chapter, and after you have studied your review guides. So we're talking about the kidneys, right? So if you see here in this, this um, very uh, crude <laughs> drawing of what a blood vessel, there's your blood vessel, and there's your tubulars, right? So blood vessels enter the kidney, right? They're carrying waste, such as things like urea and creatinine, right? And so they come in, and if you've ever seen pictures of those blood vessels with the tubulars when you're doing anatomy and physiology, it looks like they're somewhat of a little bit of a tangled mess. Kind of what it looks like inside your lungs when you see your blood vessels, you know, and, and inside there where that exchange of gas happens. They're kind of similar looking and they kind of similarly work the same way, right? So these capillaries, both in your, in your lungs and in your kidneys, when it gets down to those capillaries, they're like one cell. So they're, they're so thin that it allows the exchange of in your lungs, gases, and in your kidneys, things like waste, right? So those tubulars, they filter out the waste and then they put it into the urine and then it exits the kidney, it exits the kidneys, right? So the kidneys are where these exchanges are taking place. And then it exits out of that kidney in, into urine and leaves the body, okay? So you kind of look, like I said, this is kind of, it looks like a little bit of a tangled mess, right? So blood flows into the kidney through that renal artery. And then waste are filtered out at that glomerulus. And then the capillaries surround the tubulars. And like I talked about, those capillaries, just like inside the lungs, they're that one layer thin of cells. So they're so thin, they allow the movement of things from the blood that's in the capillaries into the tubulars, right? And then the blood flows out of the kidneys through the renal vein. So make sure you understand that renal artery into the glomerulus into the capillaries. The exchange takes place where we take those, the waste out, and then it leaves through the renal vein. So remember, renal arteries are the things that blood vessels carry blood into the kidneys, right? And then there's the arterioles, the little arteries, as they, as they start to get smaller and smaller, right? And then you have the glomerulus, like what I talked about, it's a tangled cluster of blood capillaries, okay? And then the renal vein is that blood vessel that carries blood out of the kidney, okay? So make sure that you can understand how this process works. And if you guys want any problems with this, please let me know. But you'll see that glomerulus, if you see on the top of this tangled mess, right? We see the blue being the vein, the red being the arteries, right? And you see at that top, kind of over to the left-hand side, we see that picture of that glomerulus, right? And, and let's just remember, guys, it's the same. And you look down here in this bottom picture, it kind of shows you this little tangled ball of mess. And this is where that exchange takes place because we need to get it down to that single wall, single cell wall capillary so that we can take the waste out, right? Okay, so the tubular system, what's the tubular system made up of, okay? So we have Bowman's capsule, right? I'm sure you guys have heard this before in anatomy and physiology. And it, that capsule, when we think about a capsule, we think about a pill we take, right? In a capsule and a pill that we take is it has that plasticky outside container somewhat. And then the medicine, if we open one of those capsules up, that powdered medicine is on the inside. Kind of think of that capsule, that Bowman capsule is that it surrounds that glomerulus, right? And then you have your proximal tubules, your loop of henle, 
your distant tubules, and then your collecting tubes. Okay? So kind of make sure that you study and you understand this process. And if any of this is confusing to you guys, because I know it can be, please reach out to me. We're going to also go over this in lab hands on and we can discuss it um, more in depth. But make sure that you're really looking at this and you're starting to at least understand the parts, right? And kind of how this process works. So what are the four parts of the blood vessel system? Okay, use this guys to see how much you're retaining from previous classes, such as anatomy and physiology. So we'll start with that one. Like, what are the four parts of the blood vessel system? Okay, remember, we have that renal artery, and we're, we need to break this down. We're talking about the blood vessel system and the tubular system. Okay, so in the blood vessel system, we know we have arteries, veins, and capillaries, right? So we have that ar renal artery that comes in into that glomerulus, which is surrounded by that Bowman capsule, right? And it goes down to the capillaries, which are where we're going to be able to see the exchange, where we can take the waste, like creatinine, out of that blood and move it into our tubulars, okay? And then once that exchange has been made, we dropped off the creatinine, right? Now the blood needs to leave in the, through the renal vein and back through the system all over again, right? So what are the five parts of the tubular system? We have Bowman's capsule, right, that surrounds our glomerulus. Then you have proximal tubules, the loop of Henle, and it's a loop, you'll see it, the distal tubule, because it's on the other side of the situation, right? And then the collecting tubes, where the urine starts to collect, right? So please, guys, go through this. Make sure you understand the blood vessel system versus the tubule system. And again, if you have any questions, you can text me, email me, call me, or like I said, we will be going over this in lab as well, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions and get further clarification on this process if you need it. Okay, guys, so we're talking about the urinary system, right, which is more than just the kidneys. So what does our urinary system do? What's its job, right? Well, its main job is to remove unwanted waste from our blood, right? It also helps us stabilize that blood volume. It helps with the acidity of our blood and the electrolytes and the electrolyte balance in our blood, right? It regulates extracellular fluids, those ones that can build up. We've all had our hands swell, right? We've seen maybe our grandmother or mother have their feet swell, right? It helps regulate that. It secretes hormones. Right? And we know our kidneys are a part of our urinary systems and our kidneys help with secretion of certain hormones. And those two hormones are erythropoietin, which helps regulate the rate of red, red, red blood cell formation. And we, you may have heard about this in the news when we've had endurance athletes like cyclists, like Lance Armstrong, that have uh, taken illegal substances that will help them increase their red cell, blood cell formation, right? Because red cells are what carry our hemoglobin, right? And it gets more oxygen to our muscles and our cells, right? So it, the more red cells you have, the more oxygen carrying capacity you have. So it is a way for them to sadly cheat to try to get more red cells so they can carry more oxygen so they can perform at a higher level. So again, that hormone that our body naturally produces to keep us in homeostasis, it helps control that rate of red blood, blood, excuse me, red blood cell formation. Then we also, the other hormone is renin, and that hormone helps regulate our blood pressure, right? And we can see where our kidneys could help regulate our blood pressure, right? Because I'm sure you have heard someone in your family or someone you may know that their doctor puts them on a blood pressure medicine to bring their blood pressure down into the normal range, right? Well, sometimes they have to get a combination of a diuretic with their blood pressure medicine to get them to release some of that extracellular fluid they're carrying, which is causing their blood pressure to elevate, right? So that's why you'll see people do that sometimes. 
And it could be because their kidneys are not performing optimally, which means maybe if your kidneys aren't as healthy as they need to be, they're not producing the hormones the way they need to. It also helps um, regulate the absorption of calcium ions by activating vitamin D. That's why you see vitamin D added to milk sometimes or even calcium and vitamin D added to your orange juice because you really need that vitamin D as well uh, to help you. You can take in all the calcium you want in your diet, but if you're not able to absorb that calcium, it's not gonna do its job, okay? So vitamin D is also one of those things you can get by getting out into the sun, but not always. Sometimes no matter how much sun you get, you still don't get enough of your vitamin D. So just remember, it also helps regulate that. So here's our thinking slides, right? And this is a way for you to start learning right now and see what you're learning, okay? You watch your PowerPoint presentations, you read your uh, chapter, corresponding chapter, you fill out your review guides and you study your review guides because for us to get this stuff in our memory and understand it, we have to go over and over it. So you guys have the ability at home to pause these videos and kind of see if you're doing this. If you start doing these think slides, it will help you start learning quicker so that you'll be ready when the test comes. So use these slides to help you study. Okay, continuing with our urinary system, okay? And just going over the parts of our urinary system, right? Our kidney is a reddish brown bean shaped organ. You see a picture of one up there in that top right hand corner, right? Then you have your renal cortex, which is that outer area of the kidney, right? So just think of the covering, okay? Then you have the renal medulla, which is that inner region of the kidney, middle, middle, right? So if you think of cortex as covering, you know that's the cover on the outside. If you think of medulla as middle, you will know it's the middle section. And then we have the renal pelvis, which is that funnel-shaped hollow area, right? And remember, the functioning unit of a kidney, and we have approximately one million of them in each kidney, is that nephron, okay? So make sure you go through and you understand each and every part of our kidney, right? Which this should be a review for you from what you've already learned in anatomy and physiology. So guys, these are in your black binder. They're in there with your uh, review guides. And remember, you're gonna be turning that black binder in uh, on September the 21st, that Monday when you take your profiles and panels quiz, you will turn in your black binder at the front of the room for a grade. What am I looking for? I'm looking that you have put all of the information that I handed out to you in the big black clip the first day of class in lab that you've put that into a one inch black binder and that you've tabbed it so that you can easily get to each thing that is in there, okay? It also makes you go through there because study guides are in there for tests, right? For your final exam in lab and lecture. The, the profiles and panels study guide. Remember in the profiles and panels, I gave you one that was blank and one that had the answers so that you could study for that. And remember, the quiz one on profiles and panels will be taken Monday, September the 21st. So when you come into class, you're going to lay your black binder out there and the review guides for chapters one and two should already be filled out. If they're not, then that's you miss points, right? Because you should have already read chapters one and two in your textbook, watched the PowerPoint presentations on one and two online and filled out your review guide, studied them, and you're ready to take the test because it opened today. Okay, so you will drop that black binder at the front of the room on Monday, September the 21st, and you will get a grade based off that. My review guides on chapters one and two are filled out. Everything is ordered and is tabbed. Okay, put your name somewhere on your black binder. I don't care where, on the front cover, on the front inside, but please put your name on that black binder before you turn it in, okay? And then you will drop that black binder off. We will put all our stuff in the cubbies, including our cell phones and any smartwatches. We will sit down with our number two pencil. I will hand out your profiles and panels quiz. We will take that, take a break, and then start our lab. So make sure that, that, that on these homework sections, you're sitting here and doing these. You're describing a nephron in your own words, okay? What do you think a nephron is called? 
Why do you think, excuse me, the nephron is called the functioning unit of the kidney? Now, I want you to fill these things out at home. So, you want to make sure your answer contains that it's found in the medulla and contains capillaries and tubules, right? You want to make sure that it contains that it is where urine is formed. So, here's a really good up close picture, okay, of our kidney. So, where is the cortex? C for covering, right? That's that outer section of our kidney that covers our kidney, right? Where is our medulla? M, middle, right? That's that middle part of our kidney, okay? Where is the glomerulus, okay? And remember, here's an up-close picture of that glomerulus over to your right-hand side. On your left, you'll be able to point out, you'll see that renal artery and that renal vein coming into our kidney, right? You'll see that big outer layer cover, right? You'll see the middle part. You'll be able to see the middle for the medulla and the C for the cortex, right? And then over to your far right, right? We'll see that glomerulus, right? Which is all that tangle of capillaries that is housed inside the Bowman's capsule, right? Where our tubular start. And so then we start seeing that exchange. And this is why I compared it to your lungs, right? Because stuff can go out and stuff can go back in, right? Stuff like water, stuff like sugars and salts, things like urea and creatinine in your waste, right? So we see where that is. And then we understand that Bowman's capsule is what covers that glomerulus. So still on the anatomy of the urinary system, right? We talk about the renal corpuscles. It's composed of the glomerulus. It's that tangled mass of capillaries, right? And then that Bowman castle, capsule, which has that thin walled structure, surrounds that glomerulus. And from the previous picture, you can see, and there's a smaller one, the, the, the one more for this is, of course, much better for you to see. But you can see where that tangle of capillaries in that glomerulus is down inside that Bowman capsule that surrounds it. And that's where the two things come in the tubular system comes in contact with the blood vessel systems. So that exchange of all those things can occur, right? So the renal tubular system is composed of Bowman's capsule, your proximal convoluted tubules, your loop of henle, your distal convoluted tubules, and collecting tubules, right? And then you have your readers, which is the slender muscular tubes that carry the urine, right? From the kidney down to the bladder. And we understand our bladder is this, this hollow muscular organ that holds the urine until we get that feeling that we have to go to the rest, restroom, that micuration, right? That's that feeling that tells us, oh, I have to go to the restroom, right? That's what it's called. And then when we feel that micuration, then we can go into the restroom, right? And we expel our urine, okay? So think, where is the renal corpuscles, right? This, this slide shows you your proximal right over there to your far left-hand side, kind of close to the top. You see your proximal convoluted tubules, right? And it's convoluted because it's kind of like, it's not just that straight line, right? You see the descending limb, then it goes down into that nephron loop, right? And then we're going back up, right? Descending, we're going down. Now we're it's ascending, right? We're coming back up. You see those distal convoluted tubules, and it goes into the collecting duct, right? So if you look over to the other, you see the afferent arterioles, right? And you see how they come so close to those tubes. And so they're almost, they're touching. And so that exchange can occur, right? Things can flow back and forth. We may take water out and then decide we need to put some back in. We may take salts out and sugar, decide we need to put some back in, okay? But eventually then it goes down into the collecting tubes where then it can be taken out to the bladder and expelled. So where are the renal tubulars? See, we're still going through this same picture, right? So you'll see that mass of tubulars in the glomerulus inside that Bowman's capsule, right? And that's just a section that's kind of cut out over here to your far uh, right-hand side. That's a cutout of what's happening inside there, right? Because I showed you that picture of the glomerulus surrounded by Bowman's capsule where they were coming in contact with each other 
and the exchange of waste and fluids and stuff is taking place, right? So make sure you understand that's where that happens, right? So now we're talking about your urethra, right? It's the tube that carries urine outside the body, okay? So we see in the picture, we have our kidneys up there, right? That whole uh, process takes place. Then we bring that urine down into our, into our bladder uh, and then from our bladder out our urethra, out of the body, right? So one significant thing we need to understand, we see more urinary tract or bladder infections in females than we do in males a lot more and the reason being is because that tube that takes the the urine from our bladder out of our body in a male is eight inches long and in a female it's 1.5 inches long so you can see where if bacteria built up it would be a lot shorter of a trip from bacteria to get inside that bladder and cause a bladder infection for females versus males and then ur urinary metis is the external opening from which urine is expelled. Just a little study tip, it is where the urine meets the outside world. So the urinary metis is that external opening where the urine is expelled. So the total picture of urinary formation, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Because remember I said, things can be taken out and put back in, right? At first we were really talking about filtration and bringing stuff out. But some of that stuff, the body makes that decision. This, you know, we're trying to keep homostasis, right? So it may make the decision that we filter it out, then we may reabsorb some things, and then eventually we form our urine and it's secreted out of the body, right? And we understand that urine formation begins in Bowman's capsule, right? That glomerulus is inside there and that's where the exchange takes place. Whether we're taking waste out, or whether we're taking water out or putting water back in. You have to understand that that urine formation starts there. Large substances like blood cells and proteins are not normally, normally, right? Filtered out of the blood into the urine. So that's why we know when we see certain amount of proteins or certain amount of blood cells in the urine when we do our dipstick urine test, that's why it tells us that something is possibly wrong because normally we don't filter these things out, right? This filtration then flows along the length of the tubulars, which are surrounded by capillaries, right? So as it is going through that process, they're all together. So as it's going through, that's when it can make those decisions to reabsorb. It filters it out, and then as it's going down that process, like you're going down, back down the highway, right? You have entrances and exits. And as you're going through that process, your body is making these decisions to reabsorb or to secrete these things, right? So the major function of these capillaries are the reabsorption of water and small molecules from the filtrate back into the blood and then the secretion of the waste from the blood into the urine. So just try to remember those main things that that urine formation begins in Bowman's capsule. And remember those capillaries are going all along, right? The length of those tubulars. And all along the way, there is filtration, there, there's reabsorption or secretion taking place, okay? We filter it out and then it's in there and it goes along that process and we can always decide. Once we filter it out and we get it into tubulars, right? And it's starting to go along the process, the body can then make the decision to do the opposite and reabsorb it back into those capillaries before it goes and then to the collecting tubes and then it exits our body, right? So. Make sure you understand that. And again, in lab, we'll go through the whole process of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And if you guys have any questions at all, please reach out to me. I want to make sure you understand how this process works. And if you see in this picture, you can see that little round, your glomerulus up there, that little round mass of capillaries up there surrounded by Bowman's capsule. And that's where that initial filtration takes place. That's where urine formation begins. Right, but if you'll notice down in the loop of henle and down in there, your distal and all that, you'll still see it surrounded by these capillaries, right? So we can still have some reabsorption going on. And then finally at the end, 
we form in the collecting tubes all the urine that we're ready to get rid of. Remember, we have that feeling of micturition where we, we know that we need to go to the bathroom and we expel our urine. Okay, guys, so we want to break this down because I want to make sure you understand each step, right? From filtration to secretion and reabsorption in the center, right? So let's start with filtration. When we're talking about fluids and dissolved substances, right? Those things are forced through that glomerulus into the glomerular capsule, right? And it's done by what we call hydrostatic pressure, right? And that when that happens, it creates that liquid that's called the glomerular filtrate, right? And then that's when smaller substances can leave our body, right? So here's one of our critical thinking, but this is kind of our higher learning slides, right? Not only do you need to, lots of things are rogue memory, guys. Like when you're trying to memorize all the muscles, bones in your body, that's rogue memory, okay? You have to sit there and go over it and over it and over it till you memorize it. But we don't just want memorization, right? We want you to be able to take the things that you learn and put them together so that you fully understand things so that when you're out working as a medical assistant, working as a lab assistant, you're able to put this stuff together and use it in your job, right? So how would you call the process where some water, salt, and urine is forced through the capillaries of the glomerulus into the glomerular capsule by hydrostatic pressure? So this is the filtration section, right? This is what filtration is about. Now we're going to talk about reabsorption, right? Because that's our second part, right? Because we filter it all out, but there are things that we may need to reabsorb. So as those substances pass through the renal tubulars, and we saw in the pictures that they were still surrounded by our capillaries, right? So the ability to go back into the capillary is there. Some of those substances cross back over, okay? So we may need to return some of those back into the blood, right? Whether it's salts because we're trying to balance out our electrolytes, whether it's water because we're low on water, whatever it may be, we have to remember we filter it out and then some of it is reabsorbed depending on what we need. So again, what would you call the process where some water and salts cross back into the peritubular capillaries after filtration has taken place? Reabsorption, right? I want you to understand exactly what's going on at each point. And then last, secretion, right? So then some of our substances are transported from the peritubular capillaries into the renal tubule, okay? So we, they leave the blood again. And then the process substances leave the capillaries, going back into the capillaries, then leave again. So remember, in alphabetical order, you filter, you reabsorb, and then you secrete. Make sure you can answer these critical thinking, higher learning activities, okay? So it takes all of these together. It takes our filtration, our reabsorption, and our secretion, right? This is how we get to the part where we determine what our urine is eventually going to be and as it leaves the body. Here's another one of our home set, uh, uh, homeworks. Okay, it's in your black binder, it's in your review guides, which you should have in front of you while you're watching these videos. So as you're watching your PowerPoint presentations, you have your black binder open with your review guides for chapter three on your analysis out there, and you should be filling it out. And then when you finish watching these, you should take the time to do your homework, right? So in your own words, and I want you guys to be able to describe this stuff in your own words, because when you get the test, there could be an essay question that ask you to explain this in your own words. So what's the difference between filtration, secretion, and reabsorption? So you want to make sure your answer contains these things. In filtration, water, salts, weights, etc., leave the glomerular capillaries and enter the tubulars, right? In reabsorption, some of that water, salts, and weights may return from the tubulars to the capillaries. And then finally in secretion, some of the water, salts, waste, et cetera, returns from the capillaries to the tubulars and then it is eventually excreted in our urine, right? 
So continuing with your urinary system, we're talking about renal threshold levels, right? So blood levels of a substance, when they are too high to allow any more to be reabsorbed, blood glucose renal threshold level is 160 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. So guys, make sure you understand this. When we're talking about the renal threshold level, right? That's when the blood levels of a certain substance, and we were talking about, we were giving the example of glucose, are too high to allow more to be reabsorbed into the blood. So you think the glucose renal threshold level is 160 to 180. So if, it, if that gets to, if your blood gets to above 180, it will not allow that glucose to go black into the bloodstream. So consequently, where is it going to go? It's going to be expelled in the urine. And when you do your dip stick urine, you're going to see high levels of glucose in the urine, which is a telltale sign that their blood glucose level was too high or is too high, right? Because when it gets above 180, we can't let anybody go, we can't go back in, right? So it's excreted. So make sure you're able to put that together because that's telling us that when we reach that glucose threshold, it will be released in the urine and show up on the dipstick. That means the blood levels of our glucose is too high. So here's one of our thinking sides, right? What, with what disease would you see glucose reaching the renal threshold level? Diabetes mellitus, right? They have diabetes mellitus, their blood glucose levels are too high in their blood. Because of that, they have reached their renal threshold, which means that glucose cannot uh, reabsorb back into the bloodstream because it won't allow it. There's too much in there already, so it excretes it in the urine, and when you perform a urine dipstick test on that patient, you will see an increase in the glucose in their urine. So once the renal threshold is reached and the diabetic out of control, what do you think would happen to the level of glucose in the urine? Would it increase or decrease? It would increase, right? We just talked about that. I want to make sure you guys are fully understanding this and able to put it together. Make sure you're pausing these slides and testing yourself to see if you're starting to understand. So we want to describe the flow of urine through the urinary system, right? We talk about the bloodstream, right? Because that's where it starts. Our waste, our water, our salts, our electrolytes, our glucose, all this stuff is in our bloodstream, right? And we want to keep it at its normal level. So as that blood goes through our kidneys, right? So we go in the renal afferent arterioles, the glomerulus. The glomerulus is inside that Bowman's capsule and then the renal tubulars, right? And then we have our collecting ducts, the renal pelvis, the uterus, the urinary bladder, the urethra, and then our uterary meatus. M meets the world, right? That's where our urine comes out. That's kind of the flow. It flows that way, right? Because it starts in our bloodstream, which goes through our kidneys. We filter it out. We reabsorb what we need, and then we eventually we excrete it, right? And if there's anything in our bloodstream that is too high and out, it's not normal, it may reach that renal threshold where we're not allowed to reabsorb it back in, which in turn would mean we would secrete it out into the urine, which you would be able to detect, detect in a dipstick, which would give that doctor an idea of what is going on inside that patient's body. Okay, so be able, pause this video, read this slide, and see if you can do this. Okay, this is just what I showed you guys. This is the path that it takes, right? Comes in through the bloodstream, right? And then we, in, we leave it through the urinary meatus, right? In meet the world. So make sure you understand the flow of this. So the composition of our urine, right? Just like our body, we're mainly made up of water. So is our urine. 95% of your urine is water, right? Then the other things are your waste products, like your urea, your uric acid and ammonia. And, and that's from the breakdown of protein. So as we eat our, our food, right, and we break our food down and we store what we need, we use what we need, um, our amino acids are the, the building blocks of our protein and we need those, we need that protein for lots of stuff, right? It's the building blocks. 
What we don't use is then excreted in our waste. And when we break down that protein, we have urea, uric acid, and ammonia as those byproducts, right, that are released. And then from muscle metabolism, so creatinine is our waste product we look, we look for in the urine, normally there, right? And it's from muscle metabolism and chlorine, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, and sulfate, okay? So which of the urine waste products contain nitrogen, okay? So which one contain nitrogen? So you see the list below, the urea, the uric acid, ammonia, and creatinine all contain nitrogen, okay? So we understand that most of our urine is water, right? We understand we have waste products from the breakdown of protein, from muscle metabolism, and then from all of our other things like the chlorine, sodium, and potassium, all the way down to sulfate, right? And we understand that urea, uric acid, ammonia, and creatinine all contain nitrogen. So what are our nitrogen waste products? What three waste products appear in urine when protein is broken down? And what one waste product appears in urine when muscles are used a lot, okay? It can even be due to muscle damage, but the breakdown of that muscle, if we're out exercising a lot, what are we going to see? Okay, so I want you guys to, to, to get some numbers down here, right? Because we want to talk about the, um, uh, the amount of blood that passes into that renal artery per minute, right? And it's approximately 1,200 milliliters. And then how much urine does the normal average person uh, put out per day, okay? We can do a 24-hour urine, and uh, we'll talk about that in lab, and it really gives the doctor an idea of how well our kidneys are working, right? So normally, per day, we put out any between, between 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters of urine per day, right? Now, we obviously know this can be affected by different things, right? If you're one of those kind of people that you are really diligent in making sure you drink enough water throughout the day so you are hydrated. Most Americans go through each and every day and they're dehydrated. Um, if you're doing that, and anybody that's tried doing that and drinks a lot of fluids throughout the day knows they go to the restroom more when they're drinking a lot of fluids versus those days when they don't, right? So we know that's gonna affect it. If you don't drink that many fluids, you may be closer to the 1200. If you drink your maximum amount of water or fluids during the day, 1500, right? Also, how much are you sweating? You know, if you're outside exercising or if you work outside, if you're outside working in your lard a lot, a lot in the summertime in Louisiana, you're gonna be sweating a lot, right? That means you're losing a lot of fluids. So you're consequently not going to urinate them out. But are you then drinking enough fluids to compensate for that? I know a lot of you've heard about people, you yourself, maybe your child, someone you know, getting a stomach virus, right? And you are going to the bathroom a lot, losing a lot of feces with a lot of water in it. And they say you've got to get that water in. you got to get those fluids in, right? Because that can, can make a difference. And then I always tell people, remember, even in the cooler months, you are losing water through your lungs. If you're out exercising in the cooler weather, some people think, well, I don't need to drink as much because it's not as hot outside. You still need to drink because as a little kid, if you've ever went up to a window as a little kid and breathed on it, and there would be that little moisture and condensation right there, that's because every time you breathe out, you're losing fluid. So depending on how fast you're breathing, like when with exercise, you're going to lose more water vapor through your lungs the more you're breathing. And we know we all breathe he more heavily when we're exercising. So what's the ideal amount of urine for your analysis, right? You're gonna, as a medical assistant or a lab assistant, you may be getting your patients to collect, the, collect these urine analysis, urines for your analysis, I mean, and you wanna be able to look at that cup and see, you know, is this enough, okay? And between 50 milliliters to 25 milliliters is the right amount of urine for a UA, okay? And then how should urine be preserved, right? Because we know we may be working at a doctor's office and we may be really, really busy, okay? 
Urines may be coming in and we don't have time to test them right now. Refrigeration if the U UA cannot be tested within one hour of collecting. Over one hour causes bacteria to grow and blood cells to rupture. So then if you're looking for blood cells under the microscope, you now won't see them because they have ruptured, right? And it could change the uh, consistency of our urine and what we're testing for. So, it, so guys, just make sure you're aware of this because these are things you're going to need to know when you're getting out there working, right? Also, we need to remember when we're getting a patient to collect a urine at home to bring back into our physician's office the next day or later that we would want to tell them that they need to, would need to keep it cold in the refrigerator, right? So what types of urine collections do we have? Because there's different types, right? There's just a random urine, right? That's just like any time of the day, whenever we just go in and we just urinate in a cup and that's a random voided specimen, right? Any time of the day or night. Then you have what we refer to as a midstream collection, okay? So with this, what we're trying to do is we wanna flush out any of the bacteria that happens to be in that urinary metis, okay? Because as that, that, that urine gets down there close to the end and it's ready to be voided, right? We know that in the women, you got that real small area, right? With bacteria is, on, is everywhere on the outside of your skin. So it can get in there and we don't want to look at that, right? That's not what we're looking for. And that just naturally happens to most of us that there would be some bacteria right there at that urinary meters. What we're looking for is what's in that bladder, what's in the kidneys in that way, right? So what we get them to do is the first, first little bit of their urine, the first third of it, we're gonna break it down, right? is just voided out into the toilet. Then they take their cup, they're ready with the cup, and we explain to them how to do this. Then they move the container uh, into the flow of urine and they collect the second half of that into the container. Then they remove it when you get anywhere from doing that 25 to 50, right? Then they move it out of the way. The rest of the urine goes into the toilet, right? That is that midstream collection, right? Then we have what we refer to as first morning specimens. It's the most concentrated specimen of the day because, of course, you slept all night long if you're lucky and, and you should try to. If you've gotten a full eight hours of rest for a solid eight hours, your kidneys are still functioning during the night, right? And they're still taking out the rest and that urine has sat there in the bladder all night. So it's very concentrated. And I'm sure you guys have seen that in yourself. When you get up in the morning, the first time you go to the bathroom, your urine is usually a much darker color than it is in the middle of the day when you urinate. And then we have what I talked about earlier, a 24 hour urine. There's an example over there to your right of a 24 hour collection container, right? And this is a timed, we time it from the when we start it to will it end, right? Um, where that first morning specimen that they get when they first get up that morning, and we tell them, okay, here's the container, go home. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, most of us, okay, wake up around the same time every morning. This is what we want them to do. We want them to make sure we understand that. If you wake up typically at five, five thirty, six, seven, whenever, when you wake up at seven, get up and go to the bathroom. We want you to discard that that first morning specimen okay you empty out the bladder it's discarded you don't keep it you kind of note that time because we want you to try to get as close to that time as humanly possible later right so then throughout the day after that all urine specimens are kept right we collect each and every specimen and you can give them a small urine cup or something to catch their urine in as they urinate throughout the day, then they take it and they can pour it into the larger uh, container you see here on the screen. And they're kept for t exactly 24 hours from the time they voided that morning to the next morning when they wake up, then they collect that next morning urine. It's added to the mix, which is kept in the refrigerator to preserve it, right? Unless it has a preservative added to the container and then they preserve it and bring it back in. Okay, you have to make sure you tell them to refrigerate each of the specimens if it does not have a preservative in it. And we need to make sure we caution them because most of the preservatives that we add to the urine container can be um, a little bit hazardous. So you wanna make sure that you warn them about that if there is a preservative added to your urine collection system. 
Then we also have what we call referred to as a clean catch. And a lot of times you will see the doctor order a clean catch midstream urine. So we've already discussed the midstream part, right? The clean catch part is, is where we clean the genital area because we know that bacteria is everywhere. It's flying around the air, it's on our hands, on our bodies, on our things, right? So we want to take sure, and we're going to give them three soapy pads. And you'll see a picture of that down there over to your kind of to your right, right? The three soapy pads, we hand this to them. What I did when I worked is I had a picture that was similar to this picture over here to your right. Because some people are visual learners. So you want to, and it's easier sometimes when you're explaining to a patient, they may be embarrassed at the pictures or what you're telling them about. So if you have an illustration of what you're saying, it sometimes helps. So you show them that you want to clean your genital area with these three soapy pads, right? And you show them exactly how to do this. And we're going to go over this in lab. One to the left side, one to the right side, and one down the middle, right? Then your specimen, uh, and usually these are specimens that we collect when that doctor pretty much knows that his patient most likely has a urinary tract infection, a UTI, right? So we'll tell them to clean that area, which really cuts down on the midstream, but a lot of times physicians will order that too. So you clean the area with three soapy pads, then you urinate the first third of the urine into the toilet, move the urine container in, catch the middle part, urinate the rest out, put your cap on your urine, put it in the window for your uh, for testing, right? Or if they're doing it at home, you explain to them how to do it at home. They keep it in the refrigerator and bring it back the next day to their office visit, right? So we can, of course, do this right now here, but practice with someone at home explaining to someone in your house how a 24-hour urine specimen is collected. Guys, I'm going to know if you're practicing this stuff. Just act. Pretend as though you're your medical assistant or lab assistant. You're working in a doctor's office. Use your significant other. Use your mother, your father, your friend, your neighbor, and explain to them how a 24-hour urine is collected so that you can start practicing saying this stuff to your patients. And when you're in lab, we're going to go over this, and I'm going to know whether you practice at home if you're unable to do it in lab. So really practice this at home. Guys, make sure you understand how to explain this and make sure you understand exactly why a doctor would order a clean catch urine. Here's another one of our homeworks, right? So you want to, in your own words, be able to describe a clean catch urine, okay? And then you want to be able to understand and be able to articulate why do you think a clean catch urine collection is used when the doctor suspects a patient of having a UTI. So you want to make sure your uh, specimen contains that the genital area is cleaned with the three soapy pads, and we'll go over it in detail in lab, one on each side and one down the middle, then a midstream collection is made, right? And you also may want to make sure you understand that this is a cleaner specimen, right? Because we did the midstream collection, we got rid of any bacteria that may have collected normally in the meatus, right? And then cleaning the outside genital area cleans away any bacteria that may be out there because if we suspect a UTI, we want to make sure that the bacteria we see in microbiology is the bacteria that's in their urinary system, okay? Not in the meatus and not in their genital area. So now let's move on to clear waived procedures. So here's our learning objectives. These are listed in your textbook as well. Remember, this means at the end of what you're doing, you will be able to describe, list, recognize, perform, okay, all of these things. Please take the time to read your learning objectives so you will be aware of what we're doing, okay? So CLIA waived urinary test. And we know CLIA 1988 is the law that states what labs can do. Any lab in the U.S. in any state, town in the nation, right, that is doing blood or body fluids from a human has to follow these rules, right? And we know that we have CLIA waived test, we have moderately complex and highly complex tests. 
and has lab assistants and medical assistants working in physician's office and outpatient clinics, you may, you will be trained to be able to do these CLIA wave tests. So what are they? Okay, so urinary test. So there's three parts of a urinalysis. You have that physical part of the urinalysis, the chemical part of the urinalysis, and the microscopic part, right? So what does the physical analysis consist of? So when we talk about the physical part, we're talking about actually looking at our urine, okay? We're looking at it, right? What color is it? We look at it and we note that. We note the color. There's multiple levels of color out there. Does it have any odor? And yes, you waft the urine by your nose so you can look for any distinct odors, okay? Is it clear or is it turbid? Turbidity is just that cloudiness of the urine, which may or may not be there, and you would note that. And then you would test a specific gravity, okay? These are all the components of the physical analysis of your urine. Okay, what about the chemical analysis of urine? That's that multi-stick where you stick the dipstick into the urine, okay, and you read the color change, right? And it distinguishes the amount of certain things that are in your urine. And it's called the chemical part of it because there is chemicals in those dipsticks and there is a reaction between the urine and the chemicals to give us a result, right? And then what about the microscopic part of it, okay? We're counting under the microscope any formed elements that we see, such as WBCs and RBCs and epithelial cells, crystals, sperm, cast, and other things, okay? So talking about our physical analysis, like I told you, if you look at this picture, and we'll go over this in detail in lab, including doing a hands-on urinalysis over here to your far right, we see the different colors of our urine. And remember, I talked about that first morning urine is more concentrated, so it's going to have that more darker yellow color than a middle of the day urine. And again, if you're one of those people that are really being diligent at making sure that you're very hydrated and you're drinking enough water, you might be on that very light straw end where someone who doesn't drink enough fluids throughout the day and they're moderately um, dehydrated all the time, they may have more of that dark yellow color, okay? So what is the pigment that gives urine its yellow color, okay? It's urochrome, right? And if you take medical terminology, you can put that word together, right? It comes from the breakdown of hemoglobin. You know, our red cells live about 120 days. And once they die normally, which they should do, our, our body breaks them down and gets rid of certain parts and certain parts are taken back and used to make our new red cells, right? We recycle. But the things that we can't recycle are broken down and excreted. And when they're excreted in our urine, it gives the urochrome color of our urine. And that comes from the breakdown of hemoglobin inside our red cells. So what are the sources of each of these abnormal colors? Because we have some abnormal colors. We have what's normal. And normal is a wide range, guys. Like I said, first morning urine is very concentrated and very yellow. That's normal, okay? And if you're drinking a lot of fluids all day long, you might have a really light straw colored urine. That's normal. If you're not drinking as many fluids, your urine may be a little more yellow. But then we also have abnormal colors that we're looking for that could signify an issue. So number one up there at the top is a yellowish brown color. And if you see, there's foam at the top. It's a lot of foam, okay? It's not a beer, okay? <laughs> that is telling us that there's most likely a lot of bilirubin in that urine, which could be a sign that we're having some type of liver issue, right? Then we have that second urine, which comes into an orange yellow color, which again, we have some liver issues. That's that urobilinogen. But we know yellow, brown, bilirubin, orange, yellow, urobilinogen, right? But both could possibly be issues with our liver, right? Then we can see a dark red. You see that in number three, right? three through six, we're talking about a dark red color, that porphyrin products, red blood cells, and hemoglobin. A red brown can be myoglobin, red blood cells, or hemoglobin, and then a clear red can be hemoglobin por or porphyrin products. So you may be seeing different types of red, and you always wanna make sure you note that, okay? 
And then we can have our cloudy red, which could be uh, blood, but intact red blood cells. Okay. And then sometimes you'll see a green, uh, that bilirubin, and that's that oxidation of bilirubin. And uh, can also do that foam test to see on there. Okay. So make sure you start understanding that these are abnormal colors, right? Because you saw the slide before and we talked about the big, large, normal range of variation on the cover of a color of our urine that is normal. And then these are some abnormal colors that we will see. So use these sides as a chance to study. You can pause them and see if you're getting the correct answer. So then we're moving on to odor, right? Because we were talking about the physical analysis of urine. That's physically what we see, right? We look at it. We look at the color and we note that, right? Okay. All those aspects of color, turbidity, and all that kind of stuff, right? Also, we're going to, does it smell? If you get this really strong ammonia smell, and it sometimes, I mean, it's there. You do not have, you take that lid off that urine, it almost knock you down. Okay, that a lot of times is telling you that that patient has a UTI, a urinary tract infection, because the splitting of the urea by the bacteria causes the ammonia smell. Then you can have a kind of a sweet or fruity odor that's telling you maybe diabetes, you have some acetone or ketones in there. That really foul smelling odor um, usually is a U UTI infection, but if you'll see ammonia and foul both go together, that's telling you that that's bad UTI, urinary tract infection, right? But the ammonia is usually from the splitting of the urea by the bacteria, the bacteria splits it up. But with the, the foul odor, it's usually the decomposition of our white cells. Because when you have an infection, you're gonna have some white cells there, right? That's a sign of that infection. And as they decompose and break down, it has this really not good smell, right? And then sometimes you'll have this very musty or mousy smelling, and that's that phenylketourea, okay? Another one of our thinking slides, pause these, use these as a way to study. So we are still talking about um, our physical analysis of our urine. Remember, we have the physical, the chemical, and the microscopic. So we talked about the color, right? Normal colors and uh, abnormal colors. And another thing we need to describe is the cloudiness, right? Okay, so is it clear? Is it hazy? Slightly cloudy, right? Is it really cloudy? Is it turbid? Very cloudy. So what are some of the substances that cause our urine to be cloudy or turbid, right? causes the turbidity. Bacteria, cells, cast, mucus, crystals, all kinds of things can get in our urine and cause it to be anywhere from hazy to very turbid, right? And we want to note that. And a lot of these substances from bacteria to crystals are things that when we do our microscopic examination, we're going to be able to determine. So we see that it's cloudy. So we know when we look at our microscopic, we're looking for these types of things to explain what is causing our turbidity, right? So use these, you can pause them guys, use these as a way to study. So then we're talking about specific gravity, still in that, that physical analysis, right? We talked about our physical analysis from the color of our urine to the odor of our urine to the turbidity of our urine and now specific gravity. So you'll see right here over to your far right, up at the top and down here, these are two ways, old school way at the top and a more modern way of 
determining the specific gravity of our urine. So what is the specific gravity of your urine, right? It's a way to measure the concentration of dissolved substances in our urine, right? The solutes. What is in dissolved inside that urine? So there are three methods for measuring the urine specific gravity. You have the urometer, which is up at the top, and it's a really outdated method, but I'm going to show you this in lab. It's really cool looking. I, I think it's cool anyway. But it's an outdated method that they used to use. And when you put your urine in there, then you drop that, you see that center thing in there and it floats. The more, um, you know, the more solutes in there, the difference in the uh, reading. And then it would be little graduated marks on there and you would read and that would tell you what your specific gravity was. Of course, it is not that accurate, okay? Then we have the refractometer, right? And there's a picture of the refractometer and, um, you, it obtains the refractive index of one drop of urine by taking the ratio of the velocity of light in the air, because you look up through in the air for the light coming through it, of uh, the velocity of light in the urine. And it's a very indirect method, but it's very, it's very uh, accurate, okay? And you'll see when you look down, you'll have your ocular, your little eyepiece that you look down into and it opens up the flap and we'll go through this in lab and you drop your one drop of urine in it. You close your flap down, you look through it and this, the picture over to the far right, the circular picture is where you'll see the graduated numbers and there'll be a number there that you then you record as the specific gravity, okay? And then it's not as accurate, just like the Eurometer that's outdated. It's, it's more accurate than that, but it's not as accurate as a refractometer. When you do your multi-stick dipstick, there will be a little square on there that gives you a specific gravity reading. But it should be somewhere in the neighborhood of what you get from the refractometer. And as you do a total urinalysis, most labs, and some of the physician's office labs may not, but most labs, especially in hospital settings, have a refractometer that usually sits right there on the countertop that you can look in and do your specific gravity. So make sure you're using these as a way to study. Okay, now we covered all those aspects of the physical, right? The color, the odor, the turbidity, and the specific gravity. So now we're gonna move on to that second part, which is our chemical analysis, right? So that multi-stick dipstick should be stored. And how, how should it be stored and how should it be cared for, okay? They are in a tightly capped uh, container, right? Because as they're exposed to moisture, it's going to make them not last as long, right? So when you get a brand new bottle, okay, it's sealed up, right? You look at the expiration date on that bottle, okay? Because before you even open it up and start using it, you want to make sure that it has not expired, right? So we get a brand new one off the, the counter. Uh, we look at the expiration date. It's good. It's in. It's not expired. Then we, we open it and start to use it. So the minute you start to use it, you are going to change the expiration date to two months after the date they're opened. Okay, so you're going to get you a permanent marker and right under the original expiration date, you'll put expire in two months from the date that you open it. Because now it's going to be open and closed, open and closed, open and closed several times. It's going to be exposed to air and it's going to expire much quicker now, right? Because we dip it in a liquid and then we see a chemical change. Well, as moisture in the air comes in contact with our little pads of chemicals, it will start using them up and they will expire faster. So make sure you understand that when you're outside working, you wanna check the expiration date first to make sure that the bottle that you're about to open is not expired. If it is not expired, then once you do open it, you need to change the expiration date to two months after the date that you open those strips. So urine analytes that are on that chem strip, right? First and foremost, glucose. Most commonly indicates diabetes mellitus. It correlates with ketones. Both should be positive and the pH should be acidic, okay? So if you're looking for a, a 
diagnosis of diabetes mellitus, okay? The glucose, it must correlate with the ketones, okay? And both should be positive and the pH should be in the acidic range. So ketouria is the result of an abnormal breakdown of fats by the diabetics, right? And we, we know we've heard, everybody's heard about the keto diet, right? And so you would have ketones in your urine. Be very careful on a lot of these fad diets like uh, keto. Going into ketoacidosis is not a good thing, okay? And um, yes, I know that we can get some really good results as far as weight loss, okay? But that doesn't always mean that just because it's working and you're losing weight means that it is the healthy way to lose weight. You know, a well-balanced diet mainly made up of plants um, is really the right way to go. So be real careful and make sure you do your homework from a very reliable source on a lot of these fad diets that come out. So ketouria, remember, is a result of that abnormal breakdown of fats by a diabetic. The body usually uses carbohydrates, right? Sugar for energy, that's what we prefer. But when those carbohydrates, and that's what the keto diet does, it restricts those carbohydrates, then you are usually going to then start burning fat, which in turn will make you lose weight. But if you're eating a very high fat diet all the time, what is in that in the end, in the long run, going to do as far as your cholesterol and heart disease? So keep that in consideration and look for those healthy carbohydrates, right? So ketos are acid, acidic. So a low acidic pH is expected when you see a positive ketone. And remember, you want to correlate all these things, okay? Most of the time, if this person is truly a diabetic and you see glucose on the dipstick, you will also see ketones and you will see an acid pH. So another one of our analytes that are on our chem strip is blood, right? Most commonly caused by bleeding in the urinary tract from either kidney stones or tumors, uh, urinary tract infections, but it can be contaminated when women are on their menstrual cycle. So it's a female and there's blood in the urine then that could be because she's menstruating. And of course you would want to um, know that and know that, right? So what are the three substances that can cause the dipstick pad for blood to be positive? There's intact red cells that, that causes spots of green or yellow pad rather than a solid green. Then you have hemoglobin, which is from hemolyzed RBCs from a transfusion reaction, a drug reaction, it could be all kinds of the snake bites, burns. Uh, with hemolyzed red cells, the dipstick is positive with no RBC seen on the microscopic, okay? And then you have myoglobin, which is a substance like hemoglobin that transports oxygen specifically in that muscle tissue. So all three of these can cause a positive result on our blood pad on our dipstick. So another analyte is bilirubin, right? It's the most common cause when you, when you have liver disease, you'll see bilirubin positive. If you have hepatitis, newborn jaundice, and then it's the breakdown of hemoglobin from the RBCs produces this yellow pigment, which gives a yellow orange color to our urine, plasma skins and the whites of our eyes. So it gives that Euro color, the breakdown of hemoglobin gives us our normal color to urine. But if you're dealing with things like liver disease, hepatitis, and jaundice and newborns, you're going to see that buildup of that in the blood, and you may have some uh, overflow of bilirubin, and it will show up in that dipstick. And you usually see that yellowish, orangish color to their skin and to the whites of their eyes. So urobilinogen, right? And we remember this bilirubin and urobilinogen, urobilinogen when we talked about the abnormal colors of our urine, right? So urobilinogen 
when we talked about urochrome and the breakdown of hemoglobin, right? It gives us our normal color to our urine, right? Urobilinogen gives the color to our feces, okay? So the most common cause of this, again, like I talked about earlier, is liver disease, right? And hemolytic disease. It results from the breakdown of bilirubin in the intestines by bacteria, okay? Again, guys, these are really good slides that you can pause and test yourself and study to make sure you're getting it right. And always, like I said before, make sure that you have your black binder out with uh, chapter three's review uh, sheets out and you're filling those sheets out as you go. Because if you watch these PowerPoint presentations, fill out your review guides and study them, use these slides to study and read your corresponding chapters in your textbook you will make an excellent grade on your test and you will learn this stuff so you can be the best medical assistant or lab assistant that you can be. Okay, so some other things that are on our test strip, protein, right? Small amounts are normal, but the most common cause of this is in urine is renal disease. And you'll have a normal range, right? Very small amounts of protein are expected to be seen in your urine. But if they're not within normal range and you see large amounts of protein in the urine, it can be talking about renal disease. Pregnant women are commonly checked for protein in urine because it is a sign of preeclampsia, which I can tell you I had. And when I started spilling large amounts of protein over into my urine, we knew that I had moved into preeclampsia. It's a very serious condition that has the potential to cause death of both the mother and the child. I was very lucky. So the, although many types of protein may be found in the urine, in pathologic conditions such as kidney damage, albumin is the type of protein that is found. So the microalbumin test is a test that tests for very small amounts of albumin in the urine, detecting kidney damage at the early stages. Guys, we want to be preventative, right? That's why we have our mammograms done. That's why we have our prostate exams done. We have all these preventative testings done so we can find disease and damage in the very early stages so it will be easy to rectify. So we know that specifically when we're talking about damage to the kidney, we produce a certain type of protein that is albumin. So when we do that microalbumin test, what we're trying to do is detect those very small amounts of albumin in that urine so we can catch that kidney damage in those very early stages. So hopefully we can reverse that, right? So microalbumin screening is used to detect small amounts of albumin in diseases such as diabetes mellitus because we know that can start damaging the kidneys. We want to catch that early so that we can prevent damage to the point where our kidneys fail, hypertension, right, heart attacks, stroke, and pregnancy. Here's another one of our homework sections. So make sure you're able to define microalbumin screening in your own words and also be able to tell why you think microalbumin screening is important. So remember, your answer wants to contain the fact that screening for tiny amounts of albumin in the urine that's what it's for. And then it detects kidney damage at a very early stage. And why is it important? Because detecting kidney damage early allows the doctor to start treatment early so we don't get to those stages where we're on dialysis. So Bence Jones protein, it's found in the urine of patients with multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the uh, bone marrow. So remember the difference between protein, small amounts in your urine is normal, Overflow of that is an issue, right? We know that microalbumin testing is to catch that kidney damage early in patients like diabetics and people with hypertension because we know both of those diseases harm our kidney. We want to catch that early so we can get all that under control. And Vince Jones protein is a certain type of protein found in patients with multiple myeloma and cancer of the bone marrow. Okay, so what causes glucose and ketones in the urine?
Okay. I hope you guys are really using those as a good way to study those along with um, studying your review guides after you filled them out from watching this PowerPoint presentation and making sure that you read your corresponding chapter. I mean, you can't do any better than that, guys, if you're really wanting to not only make good on your test, but to really learn this information so that you will be the best lab assistant or medical assistant you can be so you can properly take care of your patients, right? So another one of our little squares on our um, dipstick is for pH, right? It's important. We want to measure the amount of acid or alkaline in the urine. Urine pH is from 4.5 to 8.0, and blood pH is that really narrow one from 7.35 to 7.45. pH of 7 is neutral. Below 7, remember that lower number, is acidic. And above 7 is alkaline or basic, right? the lungs and the kidneys, right? Because we filter out, filter in, right? All that are responsible for maintaining the body's acid-base balance. So what conditions cause acidic urines, okay? So why are we worried about the acidity or alkaline of our urine, right? Because uncontrolled diabetes can cause our, uh, uh, our urine to become acidic. If we are in a diet that is very, very high in protein, and sometimes that's good, sometimes not, right? But if you have a diet that's high in protein, you can see a little more acidic, acidic urine, and that may be fine. And then there are certain medications that the patient may be on that causes their urine to be more acidic. Now, looking at the alkaline side of it, some causes for that are diets high in vegetables, citric fruits, and dairy products respiratory disorders, which we don't want to see, like COPD, emphysema, asthma, things like this, certain medications, uh, infections, including that urinary tract infection, urine setting out for room temperature for over an hour, caused by bacteria converting to ammonia, which will turn our urine alkaline. So these are tips and things that we need to know because is this really a urinary tract infection or did someone leave our urine setting out for too long? These are things that we can look for to be able to distinguish this. And we wanna make sure we're putting out the most accurate and reliable laboratory test results because our doctors are using this to diagnose, monitor, and treat our patients. And if we say this patient has a urinary tract infection when in reality that urine just set out at room temperature for too long, then we're telling our doctor false lab results, and they're using those lab results to diagnose, monitor, and treat their patients, okay? Which in then turn could cause great harm to our patients. We're, we're, we're professionals now, right? We're, we're medical assistants, lab assistants, we're professionals, and we wanna make sure that we have all the knowledge, training, and expertise we need to make these educated decisions on this stuff so we're putting out the most reliable and accurate test results. Okay, another analyte or little square uh, on our uh, chem strip dipstick is nitrites, right? So the most common cause of seeing nitrites in our urine is a UTI. We need to see a correlation with the leuk a positive leukocytes, right? And remember, nitrates are converted to nitrites by some, not all, urinary tract bacteria. First morning specimen is best because urine must remain in the bladder a minimum of four hours for nitrates to be changed to nitrites. Escherichia coli is the most common cause of UTI. It converts nitrates to nitrites. So you're going to see nitrates be converted to nitrites when people have Escherichia coli infections or E. coli infections, and it is the most common cause of UTIs. A positive test should be confirmed with a urine culture, right? The culture is the confirmatory test to confirm that they have an E. coli infection. And we need to do that because we need to make sure we're treating our patients accordingly. Because we don't just diagnose our patients with lab tests, right? We also monitor them and treat them.
Remember, this is important because if we leave that urine sitting out at room temperature too long, or if the patient inadvertently forgot to put it in the in their refrigerator at home, okay, bacteria is going to grow in that urine. But it's not because that patient has a urinary tract infection. It's because the urine got left out too long. And we need to always keep this in mind. That's why I said you need to see that correlation between the nitrites and leukocytes, right? Because we should see some leukocytes or white cells if it is an infection. This is why it's so important that we get that urinalysis conducted as soon as possible. And if we can't, we refrigerate it, right? Because it's just too hard. Bacteria is going to grow in that urine specimen if it's left out at room temperature too long, which would indicate that the bacteria may have just grew because it's left out, not because they, they have a UTI. And we don't want to diagnose and treat a patient for a UTI if they do not have one, okay? But then again, the problem with it is, is that if it's left out for too long, we need to see that correlation, right? For, to distinguish that it's a UTI. The correlation between a positive nitrites and a positive leukocytes. But the other issue is if it's left out too long, red cells and white cells will bust, right? So then when you look at it under the microscope, you don't see white cells, which then could possibly lead you to think that they don't have a UTI when in reality they do. So then another uh, analyte on our chem strip is the leukocytes or leukocyte esterase. Uh, the most common cause of this to be positive in the urine is a UTI. Again, it's gonna correlate with those nitrites. It's the only analyte read after two minutes on your dipstick. And in lab, we're going to do manual and automated dipsticks. And you're going to see why now automated is the way to go. It is, you're just leaving too much room for error to manually read these dipsticks. Okay. When leukocytes are lysed, they release what we call esterase, which is why they'll test for leukocytes or leukocyte esterase. Okay, remember here, we always start out with date and time. Date and time that this was done, right? In time and military time. And so the date and time that you received that urine from that patient and did the urine dipstick. So you say the date and time, military time, a UA dipstick was performed. And you always want to put according to office procedure because every office should have a policy and procedure manual on hand that list out every procedure for doing everything that they do in that lab. And you don't wanna to have to write out that entire procedure, right? So you just say according to office procedures, which is telling any uh, accrediting agencies or any regulatory bodies that you followed each and every step listed out in your procedure manual for performing a UA dipstick. And then because you don't collect those urine, now if you actually own the baby, or if you're in a place where you actually collected the urine, then you would say you collect it. But if they collected it and gave it to you, then you just say the urine was received. That's just letting everyone know that you didn't collect that urine yourself. Okay? And then you say see attached report form because all the positive, negatives, all the stuff that is written out on a UA report form is too long for you to write it out. Now, if you're talking about just saying what the glucose results are, what the hemoglobin results are, what the hematocrit results are. You can write those results out. You can say uh, hemoglobin and what the, what the results are. 
But when you're talking about all these different things that are positive or negative on a dipstick, including the 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 color, the physical examination, the chemical exam, you want them to just go see the attached report form that's in that patient's chart, then your first initial, last name, and your credentials. So, so date and time, military time, right? A UA dipstick was performed according to office procedures. The, the urine was received. The results were, and you can write all this out. Most places are not going to have you write all this out. But if you did, this is what you would need to do along with first initial, last name, and your credentials. Okay? So if we had an abnormal test on there, you wouldn't, if you wrote everything out, this is what you would do. If you just had certain things that were abnormal, you would say glucose large, and then you would say the doctor was notified and a follow-up appointment was scheduled, first initial, last name, and credentials. Okay, so confirmatory test, okay? It's like I talked about earlier. A co urine culture would be a confirmatory test that confirmed that there was that particular, there was bacteria in the urine, what bacteria it was, so that we will know exactly which form of treatment we want to go, what antibiotic works best against this particular bacteria, right? So there's other confirmatory tests out there, and there are follow-up tests that are run to verify a certain substance that you found present in the urine on your dipstick, right? So the clinic test, the clinic test is a confirmatory test for all reducing substances in the urine, okay? That, there's lots of different kinds of sugars, right? We have glucose, galactose, lactose, right? Fructose. There's lots of those out there, okay? It is correlated with the multi-stick for detecting sugars in the urine other than glucose. So if our clinic test is just checking for glucose, okay? but we feel like something's going on there and our glucose is negative, then we could run the clinic test if we suspect that this person has some kind of issue with breaking down galactose or lactose or fructose, right? And so we want to check that. The multi-stick detects only that glucose in the urine, right? Not any of those other urines, okay? It's often used to test for glycosemia, which is a congenital deficiency in the body's ability to break down galactose into glucose. We see this in infants and it can result in failure to thrive if we don't catch it early. So if we're talking about where the doctor suspects some type of other issue and, that, and, and we're not gonna get that from the clinic test, it says it's negative for glucose, then we may revert to this clinic test to figure out if there's other forms of those sugars in our urine. So uh, my friend's daughter, Kendall, was born on December of 2000. Kendall had her newborn screen done within 26 hours of birth. She was beautiful and we both went home. They went home with, within 48 hours of delivery. She and her husband were ecstatic, okay? But then Kendall started becoming very sick. They received a call from the pediatrician that Kendall had classic galactosemia. But unfortunately, that phone call came too late and Kendall died on January the 1st, 2001. A simple change to soy formula would have saved her life, but we did not know. I'm pointing this out to you guys. There's real stories out there of real people that if we're not on top of making sure we're testing our patients and looking for these things, we can help these people and prevent these types of tragedies from occurring. So here's some more of our critical thinking slides. Make sure you're using them, guys. So remember, the doctor through other means, right? The doctor's not just going to do this stuff off of our lab tests. As a matter of fact, 
when he's doing histories and physicals, when he when when they're talking to the patient about their signs and symptoms, they're doing their physical examination of their patient. There's things out there that's going to key that doctor in on issues that may be going on with that patient. OK, so if he suspects and he just wants to know if maybe this patient has some glucose in their urine, then he knows that he can run that UA, right? He does that dipstick. It looks for glucose. If glucose is there, it's going to come up positive and he's going to know, right? Yes, the glucose is there. No, the glucose isn't. But if that doctor is, is has a child that's showing signs and symptoms of some other issue, okay, that is dealing with another type of sugar other than glucose, then he's going to want to do both. He's going to want to do that UA and he's going to go do that clinic test to see if that patient has other sugars in their urine other than glucose. And they're not being able to break it down to glucose, okay? And right here, right? This is how we chart this, right? Date and time, military time, right? A clinic test was performed according to office procedures, right? The urine was received and the clinic test was negative. Then your initials, first initial, last name, and credentials. Now, if the clinic test had been positive, how would we do it? Remember, we went over this in lab and you had guys had homework on doing abnormal results, right? So date and time and military time, a clinic test was performed according to office procedures, right? Because there's that procedure manual in there that tells you exactly how to perform a clinic test, right? We don't want to write all that out. The urine was received, right? Because we didn't collect that urine ourselves. And that's what we're telling them there. And that the clinic test was positive. And of course, if you have that positive result, you want to chart that your doctor was notified. We never notify him when it's normal, right? And that a follow-up appointment was scheduled with that patient, right? Your first initial, last name, and credentials. If you perform that test, you want to always fill out the test performed by section on your requisition form, but only if you performed it. So other confirmatory tests, right? We have acid test, which is confirmatory test for ketones in the urine. Ketones are found in acid urine. And the confirmatory test is acid test, right? ICTA test is a confirmatory test for bilirubin, right? Bilirubin, icky, ICTA test, just little things to help you guys start memorizing stuff. And remember, we need these confirmatory tests, right? Because these are screening tests. So there may be other things that could possibly interfere. So we want to make sure if we're saying the patient has ketones in the urine, the doctor may want to do that acid test as a confirmatory test that we're truly seeing ketones. Same thing with bilirubin, right? We want to confirm that that is actually bilirubin in the test by performing that uh, ICTA test. Remember here, if you have the positive, if you have a negative glucose on your dipstick, but your clinic test is positive, then you know that there's another sugar in that urine other than glucose. But remember, we use caution with every blood and body fluids. We treat every patient, whether it's a little bitty two day old baby to a 110 year old neighbor, we treat them all as if their blood or body fluids could be infectious, okay? But you should do extra care, okay? Now we're going to talk about the automatic clinic test method, and you will see this in lab, and I'm not going to go into great detail because we're going to cover this face to face in lab, but doing a manual dipstick, it's very, very difficult to do. And anytime you're talking about something that's difficult, 
then what ends up happening is opens up room for error, right? But the Clinitech is, it looks just like that. We have them in our lab. It's an analyzer that uses reflectance photophotometry to automatically read that urine chemistry test strip at the exact time it needs to be read depending on the strip, okay? So here are some advanced concepts. These are our learning objectives for this. So make sure you read over your learning objectives so you will know that the, at the end of this, you will have things that you recognize, correlate, perform, and all that at the end, right? And guys, I know this is a long uh, video. You guys can pause it. You can go back to it. You can fast forward it because you just fill out those review guides and make sure you read that chapter, okay? So now we've, we've talked about our physical part, right? We talked about our chemical part. Now we're gonna move on to the microscopic urinalysis, right? With the microscopic urinalysis, we need about 10 to 12 milliliters of urine is poured into, and you will see, we'll do this in lab, is poured into a conical tube. In that top section, you'll see what that conical tube looks like, right? And then the urine is placed in a centrifuge. You wanna make sure you balance your centrifuge, whether you're spinning down any type of fluid, blood or whatever, it's balanced. It's spun in this case for the urine for five minutes. After removing the tube from the centrifuge, all but about one milliliter of the urine is removed from the tube you want to take really good care not to disturb the sediment button that now is down at the bottom from centrifuging it, right? The remaining urine is mixed together with the button and one drop is placed in the center of a glass slide and then a cover slip is placed over it. The slide is now ready for us to put under the microscope and read. So microscopic urinalysis, right? It's not categorized as clear wave. Medical assistants and lab assistants that may prepare the urine, they may prepare the urine, they may make the slide, but either a medical laboratory technologist, a medical technologist, or a physician are the only ones that need to interpret these results, right? The COVA system is an old, outdated, standardized method of preparing slides for the microscopic analysis of urine, but you do need to know that, okay? You may see that on some type of accreditation test, you need to realize there was a COVA system out there. The sediment is a material at the bottom after spinning it down, okay? We also call it the button. And the supernatant is that liquid above the sediment after spinning down the urine. So once you spin it down, you have the sediment, the supernatant that's at the top, the liquid portion at the top, and then you have that sediment that down in the bottom because it took any of those materials and it spun it down to the bottom, right? So formed elements observed in the microscopic analysis are usually things like cells, cast, trichomonas, yeast, sperm, bacteria, and mucus, right? These are all those formed elements that were floating around in our urine when we spun it down, they packed in down at the bottom in the little button, and now we're looking at them under the microscope. So, hematuria, that's the abnormal presence of RBCs in the urine, right? It correlates with a positive blood on our reagent dipstick, right? They're highly refractile and are difficult to distinguish from yeast. And there's a little picture, and this is hard to see, and we'll go over this in lab too. Yeast looks a little bit different. It'll be easy for me to show you in lab, but that top picture is RBCs, and down at the bottom, if you'll notice, the arrow pointing towards the red cell is that one round, but if you'll notice that yeast, it looks like something's budding off the end of it. That's why sometimes you'll see it referred to as budding yeast, okay? So RBCs swell when they're in dilute urine and they shrink in concentrated urine. So if this is a very concentrated urine where maybe that person is either it's uh, dehydrated and there's not a lot of liquid in there, then we'll see that first picture down at the bottom to the far left, right, of a really shrunken RBC. But then um, if it's very dilute, that far right-hand picture, um, 
is what you would you say if they have a lot of, if it's a really diluted urine with a lot of fluid. And then the middle is pretty much what you see if it was kind of a normal situation. Pyuria is WBCs in the urine, which indicate the presence of infection, right? And it's usually in the UTI, the urinary tract infection. So most common WBCs we see are neutrophils, right? Because those are the ones that are out there fighting that infection. They should correlate with that positive leukocytes on your reagent strip. And then it can be temporarily caused by fever or strenuous exercise. That's why a lot of times, especially in my phlebotomy class, I teach them to ask questions, right? Because when I talk about if you've done some strenuous exercise, I'm not talking about walking your dog, right? I'm talking to those people who are doing CrossFit or running 10 miles or marathons or half marathons or Ironmans. These are very strenuous on your body and can produce some of this stuff, okay? So also things we're looking for in that microscopic urinalysis is squamous epithelial cells. These are, that's that top picture over there to your right-hand side. These are large cells with that central nucleus, the size of WBCs uh, coming from a urethra or the vagina, most frequently seen and least significant. And otherwise, you see a lot of these. They're usually very insignificant, okay? Because it's just lining of the skin and it sloughs off and ends up in the urine that you see, right? Okay, then you have transitional or causidate epithelial cells. These are spir spherical in nature. Um, the cells with a central nucleus coming from the renal pelvis, the bladder, and the uh, upper urethra. And then you have renal tubular epithelial cells. They're round, slightly larger than WBC with that singular large round nucleus that is kind of off center and it is very significant or most significant and it can indicate renal damage. So, still talking about our microscopic part of our urinalysis, right? So, what is normal for cells on the urine microscopic? So, you are going to see, sometimes it's normal to see, like I said, a small amount of protein on your dipstick is normal, okay? But the dipstick shows you what is abnormal. So, there is a normal amount we can see of RBCs. It's one to two per high power field. So, as you're looking down into your microscope, um, each high power field you see, if you just see one to two RBCs, that's normal. If you just see zero to five and you're reading it on the high power field, that's normal. Uh, epithelial cells usually are not significant. Um, you may see a really large increase of them if you have a urinary tract infection. Uh, transitional epithelial cells, large numbers could indicate a UTI. And those renal tubular epithelial cells, um, greater, if you see greater than two per high power field, that really could indicate some type of renal damage or failure okay and again as a medical assistant and a lab assistant you're never going to be doing looking down at that and making that determination but I want you guys to be aware of what your normal ranges are for everything so that as you're looking at these um, reports on your patients you can be able to catch anything that is outside the norm, right? Because we want to make sure we catch this stuff as soon as we can so we can treat our patients to avoid, avoid something disastrous, right? So casts, what are casts? They're the formed elements with somewhat parallel lines and rounded ends, kind of like a little tube. And they're formed tube, right? They look like a tube because they're formed in the renal tubulars. When there's an increase in urine po pro protein and a decrease in urine flow and an increase in acidity, okay? Because you think about this, they're formed in the tubulars. So if that urine is not flowing real well and it's just sitting in those tubulars and that protein is what makes up that shape, right? So if you got that high protein that's in the urine and it's just sitting in those tubulars because you have a decreased urine flow, it will form these casts, right? You usually see a more acidic urine, a urine a pH, and you usually see a higher protein on the dipstick, right? That makes sense, right? So 
Now we want to describe six types of casts. So we have the hyaline cast, right? It's colorless. It's consisting almost entirely of protein and can be normal if we see about zero to two per low power field because we look for those casts on that low power field, the amount, and then we identify later. But remember, these are some pictures we'll go over in this lab so you'll see them better, right? Then you have red blood cell casts, okay? All that is is a cast that in the inside of it is containing RBCs. But we need to understand that this is, if this is associated with glomerulonephritis, right? And then cast containing WBCs or white blood cells cast, right? And this can be associated with polyonephritis, okay? So we have the hyaline cast that are colorless, right? They're almost solely made up of protein. Zero to two per low power field is normal. Then we have casts that are filled in with red cells, glomerulonephritis, and then polynephritis are talking about casts that are made up of white cells, and we can see them in there. And you'll see that from the photo, those red ones. We see all those red cells in the center, and then that bottom a picture of the cast, we can see those little white cells all inside that cast. So renal epithelial casts are casts containing, like we said before, renal epithelial cells, right? It's associated with heavy medical heavy metal, chemical or drug-induced toxicity, viral infections, and an allograph um, rejection, okay? Then we have granular casts, right? And that's that middle picture there, okay? So casts containing coarse and fine granules from the breakdown of cellular casts due to urinary stasis or standing still, right? So if you had a white cell cast and because you weren't passing urine like you were supposed to, your kidneys are not working properly, right? And it sits there even longer, then those white cells could break down inside that cast and have these very coarse or fine granules, okay? So that is what that would be from. And then we have waxy casts, right? Casts that are refractile, they're homogeneously smooth with ends that are blunt and cracked, okay? And when we see these waxy casts in the picture down here on your far right side at the end, you see those little cracks in the side. They're associated with renal failure. So you see the pictures of the renal epithelial cast, the granular cast, and the waxy cast, okay? Here's another one of our thinking slides. So you guys make sure you're using these, okay? So we're still talking about the microscopic portion of our urinalysis, right? So now we're moving on to crystals. So crystals are counted on low power and, are, and they're reported as few, moderate, or many. So crystal formation is affected by the temperature and the pH of our urine. So we're gonna describe three common crystals found in acidic urine, okay? We have a, a uric acid crystal, it's kind of a four-sided, flat, yellowish to brown. It's associated with leukemia and gout. Then we have amorphous urates, which is a, and if you'll see that uh, top picture there over to your far right, that's a picture of the uric acid crystal, okay? And then so down below that, oh, um, in the middle of that, uh, with the middle, I'm sorry, the middle uh, pictures, over to your left, that, um, that that looks like little clumps of granules, that's your amorphous urate, right? And, and the yellow brown granules often seen in those clumps like that give the urine a brick dust color. And you see that arrow pointing towards that, that urine there in the tube, that's the color you're looking at. So you use a combination, right? When you see that, that brick dust color in the urine, um, you usually then sometimes see the amorphous urates in the microscopic portion of the urine. That's why it's so important to do each part of this urinalysis because all these things correlate with each other so we can start to tie these things together and narrow down what's going on with our, with our patient. And then that last one down there at the bottom, uh, those are calcium oxalate crystals. They're small, co colorless, um, octagon looking like uh, envelopes. They almost look like a little envelope. You can kind of see this. Uh, it kind of looks like a little square with the X on it. 
and they are associated with diets high in vitamin C. So still talking about crystals, but now we've moved from an acid urine to an alkaline urine. So in our alkaline urines, our picture up there uh, at the top is talking about a triple, triple phosphate crystal. And we would always say these kind of resemble coffin lids. Uh, they're not really associated with the disease, but we do note them when we see them. And then uh, below that, we this is an amorphous phosphate, phosphates, and it's a yellowish brown granular. And so we'll see, we see the the correlation right between the acidic and the, the alkaline. And so uh, it's a yellowish brown granulars with no distinct shape and it gives urine a white turbidity. And then down there at the bottom picture, that's a picture of what that urine may look like. would have that white turbidity and then you would expect to see in an alkaline urine, this amorphous, amorphous uh, phosphates, right? And so again, this is how we correlate, right? When we see an alkaline urine and it's white and turbidity and we see these under here, we understand these are amorphous phosphates, right? Okay, and still talking about our microscopic urinalysis, we want to name and describe six abnormal crystals found in the urine. As you notice, most of those crystals that we discussed earlier, you know, we, we really didn't cause too many problems as far as a, uh, something that you, you, you don't want to see at all, right? So um, these are the ones that we, we don't want to see at all, okay? So we talk about cysteine, right? And um, and that is, it appears colorless. It's reflectile. It has a hexagon, uh, kind of like hexagonal plates. And um, it gets confused sometimes with uric acid crystals. So we want to make sure that it's not uric acid, that it's cysteine, right? Because the cysteine is abnormal. Leucine has this oily appearance. It spears with radial and concentric striations in there and it's associated with severe liver, liver disease and then ty ty tyrosine which resembles fine needles and cheese and it's associated with inherited disorders of amino acid metabolism and remember amino acids are what make up our uh, protein and if you're uh, if you have trouble breaking those down you might see this uh, tyrosine now remember guys Medical assistants and lab assistants are not going to be the ones looking down in the microscope and determining that this is cysteine, leucine, or tyrosine. But I want you guys, when you're looking at patients' records and when you're looking at what's in their urine and stuff, I want you to be aware of these and that they are abnormal. Then there's bilirubin. Uh, that top picture at the top, bilirubin crystals, they appear as yellow plump needles. They're associated, obviously, bilirubin, we talked about liver, with hepatic disorders, right? And then in the middle, there's your cholesterol, cholesterol crystals. They're associated um, with nephrotic syndrome. They appear as rectangular plates with kind of a notched in one corner, okay? Um, and then uh, sulfamide. Uh, crystals and they appear uh, as tied in the center. See that tied like sheaths of wheat, you know, like that's what it makes me think of. And it's associated with poor hydration in patients on sulfur medications. Okay, so they're not drinking enough and they're on this sulfur medication and they're not staying hydrated. So we can see these sulfamide crystals in their urine. So we all also want to identify other substances that's found in the urine, right, under our microscopic portion of our urine. Obviously bacteria, right? We can see bacteria if it is there under the scope. And it appears as very tiny rods, bacilli, or spheres, cocci. And we would note that, right? And it, you must be on high power. And um, presence in urine, of course, is two things, right? We leave it out for too long and, it's and it builds up or it's contaminated in some other way, it gets contaminated, or it could be because of a UTI. Then there's yeast. We talked about the difficulty sometimes with the 
distinguishing the difference between an RBC and a yeast. And remember, I said it has the little budding area on it. So um, they're usually small oval uh, shaped and they have the little budding part that comes out. And then that bottom picture is Trichomonas vaginalis, which is a pear shaped sexually transmitted parasite. And it has this very undulating, uh, m jerky, rapid movement. When you look down under the scope, if there's a bunch of them under there, it almost makes you jump back because they're moving so much. And of course you can see sperm and it has an oval, slightly tapered head, and then the long phalange-like tail. And it can be found in both the urines of males and females uh, after intercourse, or uh, mucus threads, mainly um, ham horsefall protein. It's produced by glands of the general urinary tract, not clinically significant. You can also sometimes see mucus threads if people have a very bad uh, mucus drain. So how do we calculate a microscopic urine, right? So 10 fields, and a, ten, a field is when you're looking down in it, it's that round one field that you're looking at when you look down in it, are examined under low power, okay? Because we do this stuff at different times. So under low power, it's for casts. Casts are counted on low power and reported as the number of casts per low power field. They must be maintained, they must be identified on high power. So you're going to count the amount of casts you see, and then when you move over to high power, then you identify the cast that you're looking for, because you can't identify exactly what cast it is under low power, okay? And then, again, 10 fields are then viewed under the high power, right? And then RBCs, WBCs, squamous epithelial cells are all counted in each field, then average, they're reported as the number per high power field. Other substances observed are reported as few, moderate, or many. So you do the one plus, two plus, four plus, right, per high power field. So how is the UA used to diagnose disease? Well, we remember, right, diabetes mellitus, your physical analysis, if you see that fruity odor, your dipstick is positive for glucose and ketones. Then this, along with other stuff like history and physicals, other lab results, uh, your signs and symptoms, all go together um, to diagnose uh, diabetes mellitus. Same thing with liver disease. Um, your physical analysis, yellow, brown in color, foam when shaken, the dipstick is positive for bilirubin and urobilinogen. But then that would also go around with other tests that have been done, other diagnostic tests, including other blood laboratory tests that are done, also physical and history, signs and symptoms, other things like that. UTI, same thing, physical analysis, right? You'd have an ammonia odor, odor. it'd be turbid. It'd be red to brownish red color, right? The dipstick would be positive for blood, protein, nitrites and leukocytes, a high pH, and under the microscopic portion, we would see cast RBCs, WBCs, and bacteria. Now, if we're just talking about bacterial uh, contamination, which can result from leaving that urine out too long, then the physical analysis, we would have the same thing, right? You'd have that ammonia odor, and it would be turbid, and the dipstick would be positive for nitrites and high pH, but a lot of times in the microscopic, we would see bacteria only. Okay, now we're looking at kidney disease. <clears throat> so what are we going to see in our UA that's gonna help us diagnose kidney disease? And like I've been saying, you're not gonna solely use that UA result as the, as the sole thing to diagnose kidney disease. Those doctors have done histories and physicals. They've looked at signs and symptoms. They've done other diagnostic testing and they've done other uh, laboratory tests. But they're gonna use this UA as another one of their tools in their toolbox to be able to piece it all together and establish a diagnosis of kidney disease. And the way they do that with the UA is you're gonna see that positive protein and you're gonna see cast under the microscopic portion of the UA. Now, we've covered all our analytes that are on our dipstick that we're going to read. Now what we need to talk about is quality control, right? Because we always run quality control. Because that makes us 
um, that, that makes sure, excuse me, that makes sure that everything is working correctly and that we're reporting out uh, accurate and reliable lab results, right? So starting with the reagent strips, the first thing we want to do is make sure we're taking extra care in storage. And I talked about this earlier in an earlier part of this presentation about changing the expiration date because the minute you open that that um, can of reagent strips, you're now exposing them to light and moisture and the amount of time they're going to stay good is now lessened, right? So we change that date to two months after the day we open it. And we want to re really be very diligent in making sure the minute we take a strip out, we immediately put the cap back on really, really tight, okay? And then urine controls are ran whether we're doing this a manual dipstick or an automated dipstick for your analysis. The controls are, already have a known value. We know what they're supposed to, to read. And what we do is we're checking to make sure, first of all, our procedure is correct. Because I tell people, the first thing you want to do when you run controls and they're not in is to run them again. Because you could have made an error in the procedure in which you were doing it. So we're checking our procedure, right? Human error. Then we're checking to make sure that the chemicals that are in those little pads, the reagents that are in those pads are working properly, okay? And then we're checking the equipment itself to make sure it's looking properly. So when we do, when we do our action to go in and troubleshoot why our controls are not working, we're gonna look at our procedure of how we did the test, we're gonna look at the reagents, and we're gonna look at the equipment, right? Urine controls, like all other controls, most other controls, come in three levels, normal, abnormally high, and abnormally low. Guys, you wanna make sure you understand your terms. When you're out working as a medical assistant or a lab assistant and you're reading patient's charts or you're speaking to coworkers or a physician is talking to you, when he says nocturia, you wanna understand that this may be some excessive urination at night, okay? So in summary, in this chapter, we talked about urine formation, renal threshold, the flow of urine and the composition of urine. We talked about the importance of a urinalysis. We discussed medical terms related to the urinary system. We talked about the proper, proper method of urine collection, avoided urine, clean catch midstream urine for bacterial studies, and timed urine specimens. We talked about proper handling and disposing of urine specimen according to OSHA safety guidelines. And we talked about educating the patient in the proper method of urine collection. So I'm going to go through these because these are a few re review slides that you guys can use to study. You can pause this and use these as your review.
Okay, guys. So, like I said earlier, when you come into class, your test for chapters one and two opens today, Wednesday, the um, 16th. So make sure you have from Wednesday the 16th, it opened at 8 o'clock this morning, till uh, Friday at midnight to take test one, chapters one and two. Remember, it's timed, okay? And this is not the first time I've done this class online, so I know the time I'm giving you is efficient time to, to take this test. If you have studied, if you're going to have to sit there and try to look the question up in your book or look it up in your review guide or go online and look it up, no, it's not going to be enough time for that, and you're going to time out and fail that test. So you better be ready to take it, okay? Also, we talked about in lab class last week that on Monday, September the 21st, when you came into lab, the first thing we would do is take our profiles and panels quiz. So the minute you take test one on chapters one and two, make sure that you have been studying those profiles and panels. So we'll take that test on uh, Monday, September the 21st, and then we'll go right into our lab. Okay, make sure you guys are on time. Um, I'll be getting quiz two for tube colors, additives, and clock time and order of draw up soon. And so make sure that you're studying those things. You need to know the tube colors. You know the need to, anything that's put in a tube is an additive and you don't need to know what those are. You need to know if it has to clot, how long does it take each different tube to clot and you need to understand the order of draw, okay? So you guys, uh, make sure you're studying, make sure you're doing this. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, make sure you reach out to me, text me, call me, email me, or we can talk Monday, September the 21st after lab. You guys have a great day.